Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, the ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Boy, yesterday I had about a two-hour conversation, an interview with Tom Siegfried, which will be broken up into two podcasts in a couple of weeks. And I put it off to a couple of weeks, not because it needs a lot of audio work or, you know, trimming out the ahs and ums, but because he covers a lot of concepts that if you just listen to it now... Most of you would appreciate the fact that we had a good interview, but there'd be a number of things that you wouldn't understand, and therefore you would not derive as much benefit as you could otherwise, which is me going over some of these concepts from the big pictures to the small pictures. I know I did a prequel already to help you get the level of understanding of what he's doing. Uh, He is such an accessible person, and I'm pretty sure... If there was a bet that I could make, uh, that I would bet within 10 years he will get the Nobel Prize. He has really pulled together so many different pieces of working with cancer. So he's uh, the PhD, not an MD, who has done a lot of work uh, with cancer and the ketogenic diet and other other things. But we will get into that. His whole life has followed an arc of from epilepsy to various neurological conditions, to uh, getting into uh, treating cancer. So I think the concepts that he discovered along the way are valuable to go over. You know, why is he so, why is he so sought after? Why are his therapies now being done in Turkey and Hungary and Egypt? And uh, some of them, there's a number of doctors here that are lobbying to get this way of treating cancer as the defined dominant way. So this is treating cancer as a metabolic disease as opposed to a genetic disease. I guess I might as well start here. And the difference between those two is that it really goes back to back in the 50s when Crick and Watson got the Nobel Prize for DNA, how DNA was put together in the human genome. And so since then, everybody's been looking for a gene that does this or does that, you know, that's like operating switches. Very, it's a very computational way of looking at things. Not that that's wrong, but genes have the correlation of you have a certain genetic mutation, they would call it, or you have a certain um, inborn error metabolism, a, a, a gene, a mutation that you're born with. And we know some of those, you know, are you fated to cancer? Well, that has never really panned out. There are some extreme minorities of cancers that if you have a certain mutation, they can get just right with a particular chemotherapeutic drug. But that is, I think, way under 1%. So what accounts for the rest of it? And by the way, I just sort of, not to be too light on that, I I can go a long way in talking about genes and getting very complicated, and I don't want to go there right now. Generally, it's called the somatic mutation theory meaning that a genetic mutation, if you weren't born with it, you got it through environmental exposure. So you had a genetic mutation. You had a partially damaged DNA. And that partially damaged DNA created a structure, created a function that was not as what it, as it should have been. And it propagated from there. So it's a whole genetic basis of cancer. So the somatic mutation theory. As opposed to cancer's that get started primarily due to mitochondrial damage. So the mitochondria, we talked about this before, the mitochondria is in every cell except for your red blood cells. So it's we have cells and you can go online and can you look at your basic anatomy of a cell. I'm not asking you to do it. I know it's a podcast. You're probably in the car or even at a gym, but it, you need to have some basics, basics down. And I know that anybody listening to this podcast has had the basics in high school, and more than likely, they've had the basics again in college if they were a zoology or a biology major. And then, if there's medical students listening to this and or other doctors, 
we now know you had it the third time through when you actually had to memorize these various pathways. And I'm sure you've forgotten them, and that's fine. So did I. So I had to go back, and prior to talking to Tom, a number of papers and pathways to get familiar with, right down to the next step in the enzyme, to make the conversation with him be a little more fluid. Um, and so it was really like boning up for my medical school exams. And it worked out very well. I felt very comfortable in talking to him, and the questions were, uh, I think, a little deeper. But his uh, his path to discovering what he's discovered, the whole metabolic, and he wrote a book in 2012, I thought it had come out a lot earlier, called Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. It's a small tome. It's a couple inches thick. And uh, the summary, as he will say, has sort of been rewritten by Travis Christofferson in a book called Tripping Over the Truth. So however you want to get there, that's the overall plan. But here's how he came to this. And he references the Warburg effect. So we have to go back and talk about Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg was born in the 1800s. I think it was 1883, within a couple of years of being right, if not exact. And um, he came from a, a very well-educated family. And he came from a very affluent family. So this allowed him privileges of both education and people that he could rub shoulders with and who came to his house to be um, indirectly teachers of him. Einstein was being one. That there was Back in the day, they socialized at people's homes, had these salons in essence. So if you can imagine Einstein actually playing the violin in your parents' home, that's how close they were. That's documented. And a few others too. His father was a director of physics. So why does all that matter? It matters that he had from an early age the access to the vocabulary, the access to the concepts that made him a great scientist later on. So fast forward into after World War I, into the early 20s, uh, he had already been known to do some research on metabolism and of, uh, he started off with sea urchin eggs and reproduction, but what he started to investigate were cancer cells. How are cancer cells different than regular cells? So that was a problem. How are cancer cells different than regular cells? So he started looking into it. And what he realized is that, and he would look at tissues as opposed to single cells, and there's a reason for that. So he would put cancer tissues under 100% oxygen and I'm going to go back a little bit. He would, this is true, <laughs> that he put on cancer cells under 100% oxygen. In the mitochondria, you have a function called respiration. So respiration means the combining with oxygen. Okay, you need oxygen to have respiration. So it's a respiration. So the mitochondria has a number of processes in there, and we're going to have to get into it a little bit. So this is going to be unlike other podcasts. We're going to get a little technical, but I don't think we have to get so deep. We're going to exercise some common sense in this as well. So, you know, oxygen comes in to a cell. It's taken up through a thing called glycolysis. as glucose. It ends up to pyruvate. Pyruvate goes, goes into the mitochondria, and the mitochondria makes even more energy out of it. So it's two parts, and I've mentioned this before. One is without oxygen, glycolysis has no need for oxygen, does not use oxygen, and is a very inefficient way of generating energy called ATP. However, when it gets into respiration, the mitochondria, it is very efficient. So once you get into using oxygen, you really amp up the ability to make a lot of energy. So we, you and I, have both these systems in our bodies now, in a cell. And so when you go to work out, and whether it's weight resistance or cardiovascular, and you get to the point of feeling that burn, well, that burn means that you have exceeded your ability to bring in oxygen for the mitochondria. You're getting into what they used to call an oxygen debt, which also means that you are just generating energy from that first part, the glycolysis part. So you are just no need for oxygen. It, and so what happens is glucose comes in, kick off two ATP, goes to pyruvate. You don't have time to mix it with oxygen to get this another 36 ATP, it goes to lactic acid. So you're overproducing lact lactic acid. So that's what the burn is. It's a lactic acid burn. And eventually that gets removed from your body when you have a chance to 
recuperate, to pay back that oxygen debt, so to say. And there's another cycle called the Cori cycle that takes care of that. I know it sounds technical, but I have to map it out in these little pieces like this. So what you have is a portion that doesn't have oxygen and a portion that does have oxygen. So what they find with cancer cells is cancer cells produce a lot of lactic acid. And so then Warburg took these cancer cells and he put them under 100% oxygen and found out they still made a lot of lactic acid. That part did not make sense. Why did it not make sense? Because in a cell that has access to oxygen, there's no need to make lactic acid. It goes scooting on through from glycolysis right into, through pyruvate, right into the Krebs cycle. There you go, right into the mitochondria. I'll leave it at the mitochondria. I'm not going to pretend I know all these steps and it gets boring to listen to it unless you're at that level. But so it just never gets there. So what happens? So here you have, and I have to perseverate a little bit on this particular point because it is important and this has a lot to do with understanding why Tom's theory and work with mice um, and and effectiveness on mice is, is so effective. So the Warburg effect was that, well, wait a minute, cancer cells still produce, produce lactic acid even in the presence of oxygen, saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, the reason is that the mitochondria is damaged in some way. You know, it got mucked up. It got screwed up by any environmental um, factors. It could be viruses. It could be radiation. It could be all the toxic things that we know and don't know of nowadays, but just know that somehow the mitochondria got gummed up by defects, not necessarily genetic mutations. That's another point that Tom makes. It's not necessarily they've incurred genetic mutations because they were damaged. They just got the the defects that are just not functioning very well. Okay, then. So the Warburg effect was, gosh, lactic acid in a cancer cell with oxygen doesn't make sense. So the part that said, doesn't make sense to what? Why always, why should it work that way? Well, back 50 years before, more or less, Louis Pasteur, he was famous for what they called the Pasteur effect. And he showed in yeast that yeast can work without oxygen, but when you give them oxygen, they prefer oxygen and they totally switch over to respiration. So the glycolysis part is called fermentation and the with oxygen is called respiration. We partly went over that last podcast. So now you have these two these two ways, and Pasteur, who was the master of science and totally famous for a long period of time, was, well, you have oxygen, all cells prefer to go through the mitochondria through respiration. Now Warburg says, well, many cancer patients are saying they don't care about the oxygen. You give them oxygen, they still just stay in the fermentation stage, the glycolysis stage, and just make lactic acid. So that was a real head-scratcher. But he verified that, and his perspective was all cancers are fermenting. All cancers are fermenting. In other words, they're not really using oxygen. They might use a little bit of oxygen to a little bit of the mitochondria that might work, but they're for all intents and purposes shut down completely. So they have a cell with a non-performing mitochondria for the most part. That was the Warburg effect. Okay, now the second thing that had been discovered in the last 20 or 30 years, and certainly through Tom's work, is a thing called substrate-level phosphorylation, SLP. That sounds fancy. Well, let me go back to the mitochondria again. When I called it respiration, another reference I could have said is oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so respiration is using oxidation, using oxygen, I said, you call it oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so we had these two parts still saying the same story, right? The without oxygen and the with oxygen. So now what's been discovered is that there is sort of a whole nother pathway in the mitochondria that under severe conditions without oxygen, hypoxic without oxygen, anoxic without oxygen conditions, still manages to make some ATPs, some energies. So they call that substrate level phosphorylation as opposed to oxidative phosphorylation. Hope I'm not losing you on this. It's, these are fundamental firm, for fundamental concepts and 
you'll see when Tom starts putting these together, and he's been putting this together over really 40 years or more of research, it's just phenomenal, a eureka moment. And this is what he's been proving through uh, all of his mice work and now through other parts of the world. So there's this, I call it the secret backup method of making energy, which is not very efficient, but it does go through the mitochondria. And of course, remember we had the fermentation that made, you know, a little bit of ATPs, but it didn't need oxygen. It just, it amped up. They made more and more uh, fermentation took place. So they could make a lot of energy but in a very efficient way. So now we find that the mitochondria has this backup very broken way, you might say, called substrate level phosphorylation. So now there's two ways that are energies being made in this cancer cell that is very different than a regular cell, okay? Okay, well, both of these are actually called uh, fermentation together. And so when we generalize, we say cancer cells are hyperfermenters. You know, they're making energy without oxygen. And the question was, well, wow, that's, how does that happen? You can get many levels deep with this. I just want you to understand some concepts when we go to talk to Tom that you'll understand his bigger pictures of what he's looking at and what you need to do and the components of his therapy. So now you know fermenters use glycolysis. It doesn't need oxygen. It cranks out your two ATPs at some energy. It scales. It upregulates that hole so it makes a lot more energy even though it's inefficient. The mitochondria is squeaking by through a process called SLP, substrate level phosphorylation. And these together are the bank of energy for a cancer cell. So it's interesting how you know, say, well, part of the story is, well, how did you find this other poorly understood secret pathway in the mitochondria to broken mitochondria? Well, because the fuel for that, so glucose was the fuel for the fermentation of glycolysis, but the other fuel is glutamine. Glutamine is the fuel for the SLP. So it took a while to realize that there was another fermentable fuel out there that cancer cells used that other cells did not. So initially, Warburg thought, you know, it's, it's all about sugar. It's all about glucose. If we can shut off the glucose, we can stop cancer. He was partially right. And he was certainly right that with a concept, and this is an important concept, if you shut off the fuel, we found out that there's few wolves, but we shut off the fuel, you should be able to shut down the cancer molecule. And so two things so far. We find that glutamine is the other fuel. That's an amino acid. So we have a sugar or a carbohydrate, depending on how you want to refer to it. And we have an amino acid. These two are the sole fuels for cancer molecules. That's a big deal. If you know what they are, then you can block them. You can decrease them. So the question will come, if you block sugar, glucose, don't all cells die? I'll get to that. If you block glutamine, don't other cells die? Because glutamine is what they call conditionally essential or non-essential amino acid. It's the largest number, um, the most popular, largest number, largest percent of amino acid in our body. It's a precursor for glutathione. It has a lot to do with the immune system itself. So it always has to be present. So for an example, as Tom mentions in our talk, that when burn patients, when their skin is burned significantly, well, that protection of the skin disappears and suddenly they're very vulnerable to infection. So the number one treatment for burn patients is to increase their levels of glutamine. What you're doing is supporting their immune system that then protects to you hope, you've done it well enough, that now they have the glutamine that can upregulate their whole immune system for that skin that is no longer a barrier. So glutamine is vitally important and you need it on crisis situations. Also as the preferred fuel for your small intestine. So you can't shut down glutamine or you'll kill yourself. It's not as vital as oxygen, but it's very vital. So now let's review. We find we have glucose. We stop that 
it's going to hurt cancer cells. Glutamine, stop that, it's going to hurt cancer cells. Okay, so how do we stop glucose? Well, you know the answer to that because this is a ketogenic podcast. And putting people on a ketogenic diet, and what Tom does with the mice, which is now being done with people outside the country, is that he puts them on a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet. So calorie-restricted ketogenic diet. So you know X amount of calories that are, call it your BMI, if you will, the required calories that you need on your height and weight, et cetera, et cetera. That's easy to calculate. So you get that. And so calorie-restricted, you know, why didn't he take away the protein? Why didn't he take away the fat? Why didn't he take, you know, why does he take away the carbs? So because, so that's why we say it's calorie restricted. It's under your BMI. They basically took away the carbs. I'm sure there's a few carbs there, but not much. When you take away the carbs, as you know, you're going to go into ketosis. You will transition into ketosis. You will be making the various ketones, primarily BHP. So all, all cells except cancer cells can use ketones as the alternative fuel. So now what you've done, you've created by having a person transition into ketosis, transition into a modified via calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, you've now, and you've spent a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, depends, you monitor that patient, and you measure their glucose and their ketone levels, and that And it gets more specific, but you just need to understand the concept. So when they get to the point of being able to create ketones, now we know we can save, protect, because there's many benefits to ketones. One, it's a fuel. Other, it's actually protective of normal cells. Um, We think of, remember, brain. We talked about Alzheimer's once before and neurological conditions. So now we've sort of pulled them aside and said, we got you protected and we can feed you as well. But the cancer cells are saying, whoa, wait a minute. We don't have the sugar. You know, we don't have a fallback. Well, they, they do have glutamine, which can uh, easily be accessed. You can even break down muscle, and so you have an endless supply of glutamine. That's tough, eh? So then the trick is ketogenic diet, and they actually, once a patient is on a ketogenic diet, they actually give them insulin to drop their glucose levels even more. And it's really important to know you can't add the glucose until after they've been able to show they've been able to produce ketones. In other words, they're in ketosis. You can't just go around giving people insulin that are not in ketosis or haven't transitioned to ketosis. You'll kill them if you do that. So that's how touchy that particular variable is. So they then give insulin to drop it even lower because they're trying to starve the cancer cells. The nice thing about it is by dropping the glucose even lower, the normal cells, which also will consume glucose, they're even hungrier. So now they've become a competitor with the cancer cells for glucose, even though they're primarily burning ketones. Okay, so they're they're now parked off to the side. So Tom's method of treating cancer, the concept is the metabolic, cancer is a metabolic disease, but his method is called the press pulse method. So the press is having a chronic stress. The chronic stress that you're putting on cancer cells is a long-term unbroken ketosis with the help of insulin. So it's, that's, that's a long-term stress. They're starving from not having any glucose, which was they were just ramping up. Now you've taken away uh, their fuel for the most part, and you've done it gradually. So how do we get to blocking glutamine? Glutamine blocking, we do through, remember, and so glutamine, to say why are we blocking glutamine, glutamine was that secret pathway. Those are my words. I don't think anybody else refers to it that way. Glutamine is the method of creating energy in the mitochondria of a broken mitochondria so it can squeak by. It's like a car with three tires. It can still work, but it's certainly barely functioning. But the fact that it can still work means you can get someplace in it, right? So it's the broken broken method, and it's also called fermentation. It's a broken mitochondrial fermentation, SLP. That's all you need to know. But the source of that is glutamine. They learned that it was glutamine because how glutamine comes into the Krebs cycle, which is part of what the mitochondria does, 
it's a non-functioning. There's no oxygen there, so it really can't complete the electron transport chain and the TCA, that's the Krebs cycle. So it pushes out a lot of uh, another amino acid called succinate. It just gets halfway through that particular cycle. And so they basically detect there's a lot of succinate um, from cancer cells and a lot of lactic acid. And so that's how they come up with that. So in order to block the glutamine, to shut down that broken system in the mitochondria, they actually have to go to a drug and uh, it's a specific drug. And so they give the drug. So if they gave it all glutamine, you say, why don't they just like kill the suckers? You know, just like give it glutamine for a month. Well, if you did that, you'd kill the person. So it's, the glutamine is that vital. You'd shut down their immune system and you'd shut down all the things that uh, glutamine is used for. And the other thing is you you would kill all the cancer wherever it is and you'd make so much dead bodies as as Tom says, so much carnage that you, you need an immune system that picks that up. So that's, you know, when you're constantly having an immune fight in yourself. And so the dead immune, whether they're antibodies or macrophages or whatever, you know, when they fall apart, they need to be cleaned up and they're taken out in the lymph node and then, you know, out with the stool and then out of your body. That's what part of your stool is, by the way. It's a reminisce of your immune system. So if you suddenly flood your system, well, all these dead things, there's a, it's called a toxic, let me see, it's called toxic lysis syndrome. You'll kill the person by, by basically overwhelming their immune system by having too much dead stuff, too much detritus, if you want to think of it that way. So you have to do this gradually. So what they've come upon is an, actually an old concept called press pulse and the Pulse is the intermittent application of glutamine blocking. So they block the glutamine for a couple of days, or I don't even think it's that much. I don't know specifically right now. We'll both relearn that when we talk to Tom. And so they, so it's intermittent. You need to know that it's intermittent. And therefore, that allows the body to have the immune system to take away all the carnage of the cancer cells that are dying. So it's a gradual degradation of cancer cells, inch by inch by inch. And I'm gonna, I think the basic concepts are best. What we're doing is we're depriving the cancer cells of two particular fuels, right? Of the glucose and of the glutamine. And we can't afford to have the glutamine, both of them going on 100% at the same time that will kill the person. Kill you or kill me. So we do intermittent blocking of glutamine through a drug. There's no natural way to block that, that we know right now, 100%. And you do need to have that 100%. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to add that pulsed. So one is called a chronic stress. That's the press. It's the ongoing relentless chronic stress. We're going to call that ketosis. The stress is from the perspective of a cancer cell. It's being chronically stressed because it can't get enough sugar for its way of generating it's ATP through fermentation. And the acute stress we're going to add is depriving it of glutamine. Okay, and another acute stress that we're going to add is we're going to put the patient into um, a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So for those of you who do not know what hyperbaric oxygen is, well, I'll give you the example of a deep sea divers. When they have to come up from a deep dive, they've been down there a long time, they have to go into a hyperbaric, hyperbaric meaning greater pressure oxygen. And so they get um, actually atmosphere. They'll get not 100% oxygen, they'll just get atmosphere, which is 20% oxygen. So they get it at um, two or three atmospheres of pressure. So it allows them like to feel they're still underwater, even though they're in their tank, this chamber and they gradually back off the pressure until it comes up to normal atmospheric pressure. So we've made them ascend to the surface uh, safely. If they came too quickly, they'd get the bends, which has its all those other problems. So that's what a hyperbaric oxygen chamber was originally for, and still is, but now it's been used uh, for a number of treatments. Even naturopathically, hyperbaric oxygen is used. So what we do is we put the patient at the time that they're getting those pulsed, 
glutamine blocking um, uh, doses, we put them in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber at 100% oxygen, which is five times more oxygen than uh, atmosphere. Atmosphere is 20% oxygen. And we put it at two and a half atmospheres, which is at a lot of pressure. And we do it for 90 minutes. And it varies from doing it every day to doing it three times a week, but that's the other pulse. So I want you to understand we had the chronic stress to the cancer cell of depriving it of glucose. And we made the patient gradually get into ketosis. And then we added the insulin, which made it a little, that brought the glucose down even further. We even added more stress to the cancer cells. And to that, we intermittently block the glutamine because we knew that was the backup energy, poor energy um, process of the mitochondria. And then we added what they call HBOC, HBOT, which is hyperbaric oxygen chamber. And so why did we do that? Why did we add oxygen? Well, we added oxygen because at that kind of pressure, cancer cells, as you say, they, they operate with I, without oxygen. So now we're pumping in oxygen and the pressure allows it to go deeper, ideally into uh, the cancer cells and create a lot of what they call reactive oxygen, oxygenated species. So the bad guys. So we're now they're going to go in free radicals, if you will. So now they're going to go in and be destructive that way. We added another level of destruction to the cancer cells. And we do that intermittent. So the acute episodes are intermittent, and then we allow recovery. Then we go back and stair-step our way down as you're gradually degrading the cancer. So this is basically an application to all cancers. That all cancers, the theory is, and it's being in my mind, worked out to be the reality as well, that all cancers share the same fuel source. So if we can block the fuel sources, the glucose and the glutamine, for all these cancers, we can basically kill all the cancers. So you'll notice I didn't talk anything about genes. Um, there's a number of details we'll get into in talking to Tom about that, but this is basically what we're talking about. We're talking about a therapeutic application of, of starving cancer cells. We're starving their metabolism of cancer. We're seeing it as a metabolic disease as opposed to a cancer disease. So if we saw it as a cancer disease, we would go and search to find out what unusual metabol what, un what unusual genes that we know of, call them um, oncogenes, there is a word for that, and we'll find what oncogenes they have or what dangerous mutations they have. And we'll find the chemical that we think matches that particular cancer and give them that. Well, that does work sometimes, but it works almost never. How's that? So we can't say that it never works, but it works almost never. There's one or two incidents in which the incidences, types of cancer in which they do have it lined up very well and lucky them for the people to get this particular kind of cancer. However, what happens truly with chemotherapy is that if it doesn't work initially, the cancer cells adapt, you know, and the chances are it's not going to work no much how much chemo. So that's how that works. And so it's, it's a whole different way of looking at cancer. And um, I think that's pretty much all that I want you to know now as a concept. So we, it's a little bit heady, but if we want to summarize it simply, we're simply saying, well, we're depriving the cancer of the fuels that we know it needs, and it needs fuels that are different than regular cells. So we can make it different from regular cells by getting into ketosis and all the other cells will be feeding on ketones, whereas a cancer cell can't. And then we block the glutamine, and then we add in the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And that's the bare bones of the concept of what we're talking about when we talk about cancer, treating cancer as a metabolic disease. There's some interesting cases that are that have taken place and been successful in Turkey. Um, and uh, they've tried it in Egypt and now Hungary. And there's, there's uh, work of a number of doctors in the United States moving in that direction. But in the United States, they really have to try to achieve uh, what they call a standard of care. So it's a big document. There's a number of ways of doing it. 
but that's how that goes. The upshot is it's a far cheaper way of treating cancer. So this will not be an expensive process. That's a big deal because you think how many people that go through cancer treatment end up going bankrupt uh, into financial, incredible financial distress, huge debt. And not only that, what they have is that those patients that do, quote unquote, have a successful cancer treatment, they have other conditions uh, and there's even a kind of medicine, I'm trying to remember what that medicine is. It's a kind of medicine that uh, it started at Dana Fiber, Farber as well, that treats, it's called cancer survival treatment, that now they have to treat all the various conditions that the patient has developed because of the toxicity of the chemotherapeutic drug that was used to treat that person's cancer. So it goes on and on whether it's uh, chronic fatigue, um, suppressed immune system, hormonal imbalances, on and on and on. So now we've opened up a kind of a Pandora's box of all these other conditions, and those are on the successful cancer patients. Obviously, the unsuccessful cancer patients didn't make it out the door. So I'd like to end on that. It's a big concept, but I think you can get your brain around it and you're probably wondering, or you should be wondering, is like, so why am I listening to this story? Because I thought Dr. Goldcamp started with everything has to be related to, you know, how effective is this for you? You know, what is the point of this conversation to you right now listening to this? Well, the point of this is that I want to frame the component of the ketogenic diet and how it's being used in cancer treatment as, as something that our bodies need to do. You know, it, it's there. It's a tool that our bodies need to do. And, and one really interesting comment that came out in talking to Tom, and you'll hear it, is that he said, you know, I could just tell people to fast for a month and their cancer will go away. He says, that there's 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 more than a little research on that. And they used to do it in, uh, in Europe, and now it's coming back for long-term fasting. And you think, well, why would long-term fasting work? For the same reasons I told you, you actually are putting that person, you're putting yourself, you're talking about yourself, into ketosis. So now you're starving your cancer cells. You say, what about the glutamine part? Um, apparently that is also down-regulated in long-term fast. And so it's not as accessible. So in essence, you're doing the same thing. So it's very impressive. We may get to the next podcast of the first part of Talking with Tom. We'll listen to that. And then I might do another set of other concepts that he talked about. But if you can understand the common sense way of looking at why is Tom creating this whole metabolic therapy, one is, you know, how effective is it? He feels it should drop all cancer rates by 50% in 10 years or sooner, as soon as this gets adopted. Uh, and certainly it's uh, cheaper. But uh, so we'll leave it at that. I have a few announcements though. Uh, we are starting a second class, if you will, of coaching. It's going to be a two-month coaching session, only going to be for 10 people. And, you know, I would love to develop a course that was totally automated. Well, I don't think that's possible. So my goal is to go through a number of improvements in coaching, beta one, beta two, beta three, I'll do this three times, and come up with a formal program, but there will always be a personal part of that. So for this particular program, it will be a paying program. It will be getting more expensive next iteration and the iteration after that as well. But we'll have 10 people. We'll be meeting once a week and it will last for eight weeks. And if you are interested in that, by all means, email me at drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com and I'll give you more details about that, you know, why, what, what we're doing, show you some of the comments of the people who've already gone through our first go through, and I hope you'll consider it. Uh, what happened last time is about 100 people ended up wanting to be a part of it, and so I had to call out. Initially, I was just looking for three, and we ended up uh, working with 10, but I'm looking for 10 people that will actually do the work, not just be exposed themselves to the information. So that's that's the defining difference. If you're interested if you're willing to do the work, let's talk. If you're just exposing yourself to more information, that's fine. Wait until the course comes out and you can watch the videos or something. 
So to that, thank you for listening today. And feel free to give me a rating on whatever platform you're listening to me from. And talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.